Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to this uh, webinar with me, Michael Hewson, and Ryan Paisley of PIQ. Yeah. Hopefully, we're going to try and give you an insight into some of the thought processes that go behind my, our decision making, or my decision making, particularly, and obviously Ryan's decision making. We're coming at the markets, I think, from two totally different levels of experience. And hopefully that should give you some sort of insight into the way I look at the markets, but also the way Ryan looks at the market, because I think it's um, I think it's important that if you're an analyst and you're analysing the markets, you have an open mind to other people's points of view. Too often I've seen on social media that people automatically dismiss other people's ideas just because they don't happen to align with their own. And ultimately, I think that's a mistake. Um, yeah, by all means, criticize and scrutinize. But for me, I think politeness costs nothing. And I think the more people you talk to who have different points of view, I think it allows you to also become an awful lot more open-minded about your own decision-making processes. Um, so that's essentially where I come where I come at the markets from. My background is foreign exchange. I used to trade uh, currencies for Commonwealth Bank of Australia back in the 1990s. Um, sat through and experienced the ERM sterling crisis, which was a lot of fun. We saw interest rates in here in the UK go up to 15% briefly. Can you imagine that? No wonder the housing market tanked. Um, but also. Um, the um, the concerns with respect to, um, well, I've, I've, over the last 20 or 30 years, I've seen an awful lot of financial crises, but I have to say, Ryan mentioned to me in the lead up to um, our little discussion that it's the 13 year anniversary of the Lehman crisis today. And we're, we're in the midst of a 13 year bull market. So um, I'm gonna turn my webcam back on now can you can you guys see my screen i'm guessing that you can or you can't oh yeah i can see it okay did you see the disclaimers at all because if you didn't i'm going to have to show them again i did not okay so here we go again so Hello, i was talking away and um not showing not showing any disclaimers which was a bit naughty of me and i'll get into trouble from compliance for, for not doing that i just suddenly looked to my right and suddenly realized oh I'm actually not showing my screen. So um, hopefully you can see the screen, see the see the disclaimers, and hopefully we can uh, get cracking very shortly with respect to <coughs> our little discussion. So I'll now basically hand over to Ryan to introduce himself. He can turn on his webcam. I, I think he's been given grief for actually not wearing a tie, yeah, but- I, I, I think everyone knows, knows that I do not. Knows. I think everyone I knows that. Shit. So I'm just okay. going to show you off again, my guys. Hello, everybody. Um, for those that you, for those of you that don't know me, sorry. Uh, my name is Ryan Paisy. You might need to speak up, mate. The audio is quite faint. Okay, sorry. Uh, my name is Ryan Paisy. For those of you that don't know me, um, I am also known as Priapus IQ or PIQ on Twitter. Uh, my background, believe it or not, I know I only look about 12 years old, but my background is getting on best, well, best part, almost 20 years exactly um, in the markets. Uh, started off as a runner uh, for a company called the Kite Group, which were massive, well, the largest um, local independent trading shop on the life floor. Um, I joined them just a, just a few months, basically, or maybe a year after they moved from the life trading floor up to the office, um, where they had a big kind of open trading floor of now obviously um, people trading on computers. Um, so it was very much my role as a runner was very much in the in the spirit of floor trading, a pit trading runner, which basically means you're the bitch. Um, yeah, it's it was a great opportunity. It was, you know, I think I'm one of the last true kind of, you know, what you'd call a runner. Um, because well, I know the person that joined only eight months after me, it was a completely different role by then because they realized, you know, they those aren't the kind of things that you can get away with when you're in an office. Um, but you know, forced up onto a desk and tap dancing down the uh, down the length of it, 
because you lost a bet or shit like that. Um, yeah, anyway, so then after a year and a half, two years, I was given a trading account where I traded oil markets. Uh, I chose oil markets purely because um, it suited my kind of interests. I'm very much man of, well, you know, as the, the nature of this webinar is, I'm very much into geopolitics and, you know, how the world is working rather than what interest rates are doing what. That's for me, that's, you know, it's not my cup of tea. Um, and also the timing coincided with the IC, sorry, the IPE exchange, which is the London Oil Exchange, International Petroleum Exchange. It coincided with that going to screen based. So the idea in my head was, you know, it's something that I'm interested in. Plus, it's, um, you know, it's everyone's all of a sudden on a more of a level playing field. Bear in mind, all these, you know, all these barrow boys from the IPE floor are now moving on to screen based. And um, yes. Thank, you know, thankfully very successful, um, you know, although that whole ad uh, the old adage of um, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. Um, I'm probably a good example of how to make it and possibly not keep as much as you should. Um, but that's another story, more, more for a pub more than a, a webinar. Um, but yes, so after many years of um, trading, um, I kind of, you know, lost the love of it slightly a few times, a couple of near mental breakdowns and what have you. Um, and it was in 2019, I decided to start Priapus IQ. And the basically the idea behind it is I want to provide people with as much information as I can for free from sources that perhaps they wouldn't have access to or perhaps they wouldn't know where to look, kind of like aggregating as much information as possible. Um, obviously within that, I, to those of you that know me, know that I'm not the most serious of people. So uh, there's an awful lot of shit posting involved in that. Um, but I do a more serious newsletter in the mornings. I'm also about to release a new product called PIQ Suite, which for you, for those of you on Twitter, that use TweetDeck, um, it's basically TweetDeck Plus. So it's like a pimped version of TweetDeck where not only can you add columns for your Twitter lists, but you can add RSS, uh, RSS feed columns in there, market data columns. I'm in talks with a few other premium uh, data providers and headline providers to you know have comments with that. Anyway, the, you don't want to hear about all that. The crux is um, my basic raisin detra is to provide as much information to you guys um, as possible um, and all for as free as possible or very low cost. Um, so yeah, that's me. My, in terms of trading, I am very much um, in the frame of mind as I like to develop a theme um, based on what's going on in the world and then I look for um, the best market to suit that theme. Um, and to me, that's the natural way of doing things. I know for many people, they would prefer to stick in one market and then try and think of themes that then fit the market they're trading. I really don't like that. I would like to, I would prefer to have every market at my disposal and to then choose the market that fits the theme that I believe in the most. Um, because, you know, there's only so many battles you can fight and I don't want to be fighting the battle where I'm looking for something that fits my market because you end up trying to shoehorn in the, the wrong kind of theme and yeah it's for me it just doesn't work but yeah so that's a, a very broad um, kind of history of me and what I look for in the markets. So, so Ryan your, your theme um, if yeah. I may sort of cut in is that macro based or is it technical analysis based? No, it, what, 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 you know, what do you what do you base your theme on? Because obviously, it, me as a technical analyst, yeah. I generally look at price as being the most important price point. You obviously don't share that because I've seen some of your cynical tweets about technical analysis, and I have to say, yeah, some technical analysis is a little bit, shall we say, unquestionable. But for me, it's one of the most important elements in risk management. Oh, but it's for sure. Yeah. So to answer your question, my um, technical technical analysis for me, it just isn't for me, basically. Um, yeah. You know, I I will develop a theme um, more uh, purely on macro um, and you know what's going on in the world, geopolitics. Um, you know, just kind of trying to get a feel for what, like, like I say, for the macro kind of aspect of things. 
Um, I will then look to the markets that you know should perform um, based on my theme. Then I might you know look for some very simple technical analysis just to tell me what's you know where I'm going to get the most legs on a trade. Um, like we've spoken previously, um, you know, on like, weeks ago about kind of similar things like this. In terms of um, in terms of technical analysis, I very rarely look beyond a few moving averages, and we're talking like big moving averages, so like say 50-day, 200-day moving averages, mm. um, previous like major lows, major highs in the market, kind of more yeah, more the price action than anything else. Um, but that's not to say technical analysis doesn't work, because although I do you know I I do dig it out on Twitter quite a lot, um, I'm yeah I'm just doing that for a bit of fun. I Personally, I you're, you're just doing that to get a reaction. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, I do yeah. think 95% of technical analysis that people use is bollocks. Um, but I think that's more of a case that it's due to most people use rubbish technical analysis. Like, well, it's know, because they don't know how to use it. And I think that's probably where you and I probably do agree that yeah. to use technical analysis in the right way. Yeah, exactly. Like when I see people with like Fibonacci fans and cup and bowls, oh, I like on the Fed balance sheet. Yeah, oh mate, it's like every time someone divides by the Fed balance sheet, an angel loses its wings. It's like, oh, can we stop doing it? I think um, this is the important thing. You, you've got to cut through an awful lot of stuff on Twitter that, and in general, I think that's yes nonsense. Uh, yeah, and definitely. But also, you got to remember as well that most of the people selling these, like most of the people selling technical analysis or selling all this stuff, they're doing it because, yeah, you know, they're not doing it because they're making millions out of it themselves. You know, no trader that's making serious money is selling a subscription for fifty bucks a month. No, because you know, why would they be selling it? If they this is it. it. And also, you know. Why would you give away your edge? If your edge is, you know, there's only a certain number of lots on the bid of the offer. If you've got this all singing, all dancing, technical driven signal generator, you do not want to share it because if you do, everyone's going to be hitting the same price and you're not going to get filled. It just, when you break it down to kind of that kind of thing, it becomes obvious that most of the people um, in the industry, unfortunately, well, most of the vocal people in the industry, and, and you know, obviously you can't slander on a, on webinars and that, but people like Sven and people like that. Just, let's, um, let's, let's, just keep, let's just keep names out of it. But yeah, we, we all know we all know who yeah. the repeat offenders are. It's but yeah, you know, and this, like I say, if if you keep technical analysis very very simple, um, yeah, it's I've got nothing wrong with it. Um, I see nothing wrong with it, and there's there's definitely a place for it. Um, I saw a yeah, tweet yeah. earlier today. If I could just jump in. Yeah, so good, good. from someone who shall remain nameless who says why are people buying cable um it should be it should be an awful lot lower i think the person in question knows he is well based on this chart why would you not be buying cable well on top of that i would also say that uk cpi was yeah. um a little bit stronger than expected you yeah, know which gives a bit more uh ammunition for the the BOE, the hawks within the BOE that want to um, increase rates. Don't forget, before the the recent UK tax news, um, mm. everyone was talking about the BOE hiking rates. Obviously, then Boris Johnson and uh, Sunak announced that there's going to be some taxation. Um, mm. Straight away, people that obviously Sterling got hit be purely because the idea being the logic, that the, the follow through logic was that, OK, well, if they're increasing tax, that's a more, that's a negative pressure on the economy. Therefore, oh. those in the BOE, those in Fred Needle Street that were just on the verge of you know pushing for a rate hike will now back off. Their timing's but, key, though. Well, this is it. Um, and then obviously you they're get today's. Till next April. Pardon, sorry. They're not coming till next April, so it's not well, a problem. No, no exactly. Know, the economy is. No, I agree. Then you get like today's BOE, uh, sorry, BOE, uh, today's uh, CPI data, and mm. you know it's inflation. You know we're going the opposite. Our inflation numbers are going the opposite way to the US. So yeah. why wouldn't you know? We've just yesterday we had quite like you know 
quite decent proof that um, US inflation is indeed transitory. Don't at me at that. You know, that's just my view. <laughs> it, it's the right view, but uh, we will come to that later. Um, it depends so on got, PPI, because PPI like, is going in a completely opposite direction to CPI, but that's a completely different um, argument. Yeah, um, well, yeah, obviously, and then you can say, well, actually, hang on, the Fed actually prefer to use PCE than CPI anyway. Sure, um, yeah, we, but, we all know that. But the, the generic, like, as in, but kind of the overall theme being, the data in the US seems to be softening, whereas the um, the inflation metrics in the UK um, are firming. Um, so, you know, we could very easily see the BOE being one of the first major central banks to, to hike rates. And also, when I say hike rates, it's everyone's got it in their mind that you know you you hike them 25 basis points. We know from um, before, like well pre-COVID, when we were kind of looking to get in, back involved into rate cycles, um, you know, there's all there's an awful lot of rumours out there that Bank of England, their first um, rate move might not be 25 basis points. It might be 12 and a half basis points. Um, well, it'll probably be 15 uh, because they cut from 0.25 to 0.1. Um, soon yeah. after they cut from 0.75 to 0.25. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, very good point, very good point. This is what I mean, it's like, so me, I'm a, well, okay, I'm perma bear on the cable, uh, well, perma bear sterling, sorry. Um, yeah. At the moment, I'm pretty damn bearish, sorry, pretty damn bullish um, cable. Um, obviously, that's because of my, my bullish sterling views, and also I happen to be bearish dollar as a whole i'm short dollar at the moment um i was quite vocal in um from like july saying i wanted to sell 93.50 in the dollar index um i think it got to 93.70 so or so maybe 60 something um so i got very kind of the patience paid off which surprised me normally when i'm patient um it bites me in the ass um <laughs> so um at the moment, obviously, what we're trading now, 92.50. So, you know, big point on side. We'll see how that goes. My target on that's like much lower. Like, I want to see sub 90s, really, but um, we'll see how that goes. I'm, I'm bullish on cable. I mean, I used to trade it. Um, so, you know, I mean, obviously, I've had good days on it and I've had bad days on it, but I much prefer buying it to selling it. Yeah, sometimes the big moves happen to the downside, and I've certainly been caught the wrong side of a few of them. Um, but I certainly didn't think that. Um, that when we were at 120, we'd be going to parity. You know, you heard all these parity calls from all of these oh. big shops. And to be quite honest, you know, for me, those big calls generally only come about because they want to get on Bloomberg or CNBC. Oh, You've got to sort definitely. of sit definitely. yourself back. They will actually no, that's nonsense because it's not a binary outcome. You've got push pull of Fed, Bank of England, ECB, you know, and for me, you know, if you wanted parity on cable, you'd have to put euro sterling at 110 and that's just never going to happen well this is it and it's funny you should say that about people wanting to get on tv it's like you know you see um the uh, banks and like fx trading shops and stuff uh, well boutiques and whatnot putting out their um, their targets you know they know if they put out a, a rascal target that's well outside they know they're going to get highlighted on reuters uh, you know i know someone who might even be listening today or on a recording of this um the works for an FX shop and you know he's openly said to me that you know in the past they've put out they'll see what everyone else's target is and then go like two big points above or below where the, the outlier is just so they know if someone looks on um bloomberg you know where you can see everyone's targets like mapped out on the chart um it, it, they stand out you know it's it's a pr exercise for most people um you know especially when you look at people with zero skin in the game um mm. yeah it's very easily to get, um, well, yeah, it's the same with all these salesmen, you know, there's a lot of salesmen on Twitter in terms in this space, which is, you know, one of the reasons why I kind of started doing what I'm doing is because I'm just trying to, I just hate the, uh, hate the bullshit involved. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a, it's a losing battle trying to fight it. I'm slowly coming to terms with that. I think you just have to basically accept the world as it is and not as, as and not as you'd like it to be. And I think yeah. that's, for me, come from experience, and certainly, I certainly think that sometimes uh, Mr. Grumpy out there could probably take a step back <laughs> occasionally, because otherwise his blood pressure will go through the roof. And I know I'm going to get grief for that comment, but yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes, well, sometimes you've just got to say, okay, fine, whatever, you know, if it makes you happy. 
Yeah, I'm very bad at that. To be fair, I'm, I'm trying to be more stoic in my outlook recently. Um, it's. it's I'd, 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 I'd never get any work done. I'd never get any work done if I basically <laughs> bit um, someone push push something out, which was stupid on Twitter. Yeah. I really wouldn't. So, um, it's not a hill that I'm prepared to die on for most of the time. No, no, true, very true. But you, we've got the Bank of England next week. We've got the Federal Reserve next week. We've got the German elections, and and for me, I think these three events probably won't shift the dial too much in terms of my overall views on cable or euro dollar for that matter because to be quite honest while they're important macro events i don't think overall they're going to change the overall direction of travel for any of the currencies that we're looking at um yeah i you may disagree. I'm agree there um because okay. I, I think I, I think we could well see a, the bank of england reduce their bond purchase program sooner than the Federal Reserve, based on yeah. that data that we saw this morning. We could get an announcement next week. Yeah, I yeah, again, I'm with you. And also, but also as well, it's like, in terms of like this, yeah, Bank of England tapering, obviously there's talks about the ECB tapering, but not a taper, all this rubbish. And obviously the big tapering decision coming from, um, from the Fed. Um, mm. But I think people people see I some I'm I, I'm convinced that there's a significant number of people that don't realise that tapering isn't quantitative tightening. You know, for that first month when they tape, yeah, you know, say say they taper twenty billion a month. Say the Federal Reserve, sorry, uh, taper twenty billion a month. They won't do that much. I'll be surprised if they do fifteen. But this round number it. Um, well, bear, in mind, bear in mind that they're currently um yeah they're currently buying 120 billion a month if they taper 20 a month for that first month they're still buying they're still buying 100 billions worth of assets um mm. you know it's it's so gradual it won't it, all this nonsense that you hear that as soon as they begin tapering the you know the financial market will collapse you know it won't the financial market at the moment does not give two hoots about the money being bought hence why You've got like the reverse, uh, you've got the repo operation, like, you know, now plateaued above a trillion because, you know, banks, it's not like, the, you know, they're not hard up for cash at the moment. If, if there's a, a liquidity drain, well, it's not even a liquidity drain of 20 billion, sorry, yeah, 20 billion a month, that's not going to affect anyone. It's certainly not going to, you know, be the tipping point for financial markets. So much um, is being overplayed on this hand. Um, yeah, and when they do start tapering and nothing happens, stocks continue to go up, bonds mm -hmm. continue their long-term trend down. Um, yeah, it's there's going to be a lot of people trying to you know re refit the narrative to suit the fact that nothing has happened. Um, but I, but I yeah, also I, think the tapering discussion is a bit of a red herring because I think the Fed is more concerned about the employment outlook or the unemployment rate than it is yeah. on the inflation outlook, and those oh, numbers yeah. really bear that out. I think. Yeah, especially at the moment, you know, they've more. Uh, I kind of laughed off the idea that their um, their inflation metric had been hit, um, but you know, you can't disagree with Fed members themselves when you know an increasing number of them have said that the the um, the inflation um, metric of you know of the inflation employment um, significant progress. Uh, yeah, they're all saying now that 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 target has been met. I find that a bit kind of odd because. You know this sorry, sustained over two percent for a long period of time, but we haven't hit that yet. Yeah, we okay, we're over two percent, but you know everyone's calling it transitory, which it is. Um, but anyway, that's by the by. Asked, what inflation percentage would we look at post tapering, either in the UK or the US or both? Um, I personally don't think it's that important. Central banks generally tend to look through inflation if it doesn't suit and wait for it to come back, and I don't think this will be any different. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, there's the thing is, there are so many tools now in the in the um, monetary policy toolbox that we're not, you know, people that people are there actively looking for repeats of, you know, the Weimar Republic and like hyperinflation. It's almost like some people want that to happen just so they can say they were right, um, which mm. is a ridiculous stance to take because you're, you know, that's that was an awful time. Um, so I won't get my head around those people, and I kind of think they need to be avoided. No, but I think it was different then because obviously everyone's doing it now, so the net effect of it basically tends to cancel well, each other out. And, and this is this is the thing as well, right, Michael? It's like you know, say yeah, you know, say 
the US, um, you know, say we do get another problem in a few years time, as has been proven um, in, you know, in COVID and, you know, pretty much every crisis recently, if the US works to solve their own problem, it, the knock-on effect, it, it kind of goes a long way to solving the global economic problem. So, you know, that's why you, you, you know, you often see central banks waiting for the Federal Reserve to act first because it knows it takes the pressure off of what they need to do. Um, mm. And that's only going to increase. It's like every time we have a crisis now, you know, I remember the, you know, talk going back about how it's the anniversary of uh, the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. I remember then, yeah, I remember sitting at my desk and hearing like 300 million announced as, you know, like for a bailout for this, that and the other. And I was like, yeah, blowing my mind. It's like, oh my God, like $300 billion. Now, $300 billion, it's, you know, that's it's absolutely, your... it's bugger all. You know, tr yeah. like, you know, we joke like billions became the new millions and now it's trillions of the new billions. And um, I think, this is, I think this is the point when it comes to equity markets, I'm also being asked, do we have any thoughts on China? Obviously, there was those retail sales figures this morning, which were pretty awful. Um, obviously, we have the Evergrande situation and obviously yeah. the regulatory crackdown. How much scope is there for what China's doing right now to cause a little bit of a schism in financial well, markets? Obviously, in terms of the, the data from China, um, yeah, I think every piece of data you take um, out of China um, in terms of economic data, you have to take a pinch of salt. I personally, I do not trust and do not look to Chinese economic data for any of my decisions. Um, yeah, it's it does, people... it does generate a reaction though, so you can't completely. Oh, of course, it. no, no, of course it, it will generate a knee-jerk reaction on the following day's trade or following week's trade. But for me personally, when I'm building up my theme for trading, um, I do not look at you know, industrial output from the official Chinese numbers as a. Um, also, um, I do not look at official data to help me with my themes. Um, I look mm. for comparable, you know, I look for trade data, like data from the US on kind of trade with China and from with Europe and, you know, German exports and stuff like that. Those are the metrics that you can use to try and gauge your... Yeah, that was, that was a big tell, that German exports number to China the other week. That was a big exactly. tell for, exactly. um, yeah. Um, but in terms of China, also that you know, talking about geopolitics, which is obviously you know, China is the big one. Um, you know, that would be one of the first things I look at in the morning is what is the overnight news from China, various Chinese ministries. Um, you know, there's multiple ways you can do that. Obviously, Twitter's a very easy way. You know, you've got um, Reuters. If people have got Reuters, you've obviously got the News Corp channels and and whatnot. Um, in terms of my current outlook for um, how things are going say on US Sino Sino uh, relations. Um, mm. Both parties are desperate to come to some kind of agreement. Um, but obviously no one wants to be seen as the one, you know, backing down or going a bit kind of keen, although Biden's very recent comments have seemed a little bit keen, although he's denied that, uh, denied that he has been kind of desperate for an agreement and a meeting. Um, in terms of the short term, I think we're going to see plenty more chop in terms of the rhetoric between the two parties. Um, but medium term, um, I think everyone's going to get together and you know they'll be shaking hands. Um, you know, we're seeing an increased amount of pressure from uh, like agricultural sector in the US where they're desperate for you know the trade to keep go to get going again. We're seeing a lot of exporters starting to get very keen on Biden to kind of make an agreement. And also from the Chinese perspective, although they're they're very happy to pretend it's all singing or dancing, the fact that they know they've got this Evergrande um, hangover looming, um, and also if you look at the high um, the high frequency data from China, namely the you know the the highway traffic, the highway traffic has stalled, you know, pardon the pun, um, well, <laughs> well 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 below the you know the 2019 levels, so. Yeah, make no mistakes, China are hurting, um, you know, as well as the US. So I do believe that as much as we'll see some quite choppy, noisy um, rhetoric in the short term, and especially using Taiwan as just, you know, a little bit of a, an easy headline to grab, um, I do think medium term it will be all sorted out. And, I, you know, I'm at the moment I'm looking to get, well, I'm getting like very itchy trigger finger on maybe perhaps punting a, a small long in Evergrande itself because um, 
yeah, I don't think I don't think for one second the Chinese will let that uh, the contagion spread. Um, You're going to yeah. do what I did with RBS back in 2009. That kind of, yeah, when you when you mentioned that trade at the early on before we went on air, I was thinking, well, funny you should say that. I'm looking to do very similar. It's just, yeah. you know, Evergrande is such a, you know, it, it's such an advertisement for like a failed policy from China. Um, you know, if they let this, you know, I think they're, they're making a very good example out of um, Evergrande um, in terms of, um, to you know, comparative companies within China. They're saying, look, you know, we are going to let you fall to pieces. We are going to let you erode all your capital um, and your share price, more importantly. Uh, but will they let that damage the the rest of the, you know, the, the Chinese experiment? I don't think for one second they will allow that. Um, it will just be too embarrassing for them. So but it's just not just that, though. It's the banking sector as a whole as well. well. They don't want the ripple out effect. I mean, we saw what happened with Lehman's, right? And well, exactly. Exactly, and bearing in mind at the time, and even more recently now, they're saying, you know, they're making all these, like, they're bringing forward all this regulation, you know, whether or not you believe it's the reason or not, that, but the reason they're giving is they're bringing it forward to, you know, to stop, you know, over, you know, excessive risk um, to their financial system. Well, you know, a bit late for that with Evergrande because that's a huge risk to their financial system, which is another reason why I just don't think they'll let it, you know, completely tear tear the um the economy apart you know they they can do a lot to stop it they yeah they can let it fail and they can contain contagion um yeah so if i was a betting man gun to my head i would be looking you know to to start maybe adding to a long position in uh in that um you know it's one of those you know you got to talk about every trade in terms of risk reward obviously there's high risk that this goes to zero um but the reward it's worth the same as you said when you buy, buy rbs at 10 pence um you know it's a, it's it's yeah, an what's equally, your downside? 10 pence. Right. this is it it's you know and that's how you got to look at it you know would i be looking would i have i been looking to buy Evergrande until the last couple of days not a chance but now they're trading what's sub three um i just think yeah there is more upside than downside um i think that you make a very important point there, you wait for the market to come to you and you don't chase the market. I think one of the most common mistakes I used to make when I was younger was that if I got a trade wrong and I lost money on it, I was quite keen to jump back in again and, oh, and make yeah, that yeah. loss back. But you don't, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be trying to chase a loss and try and make it back. You know, at the end of the day, you know, trades are like London buses. You may not see one for about, you know, two or three days. And then suddenly three come along at once. And then really it's a question of whether or not you're spoiled for choice. And I think yeah. that's the key enemy of any trader, impatience. Oh, most definitely. And especially, you know, and that impatience certainly ratchets it, like ratchets up, sorry, um, a few gears after you've had a, a, a losing trade because mm. you're instantly thinking, I need to make that money back. Um, yeah, and it, it is the wrong it is the wrong way to uh, to look at it because you know, for me again, I you know I think fortunately by building themes and then building trades around the theme, it does kind of almost subconsciously slow down my process. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not I'm not kind of fitting technical levels to a market just so I can get a trade on. Um, yeah, but again, yeah, like I said, I'm, I will not say that technical trading doesn't make money because I know a couple of traders that pretty much only rely on technical trading and they make money it just so happens well, that you know this this chart here is a case in point i'm not interested in the cable at the moment but if it drops back to my blue line then i will buy the cable with a stop loss just below that line and look for a rally back to 139 140 because it's my view is cable goes up i've set a rule on it that rule is the trend line from the lows in august we've we've seen two or three touches of that line so it's valid therefore my my loss my downside is fixed i know exactly what it's going to be but on the flip side i also know what my profit is going to be because i've got three peaks four peaks around about 139 10 15 20 which are likely to cap any move higher so that's where i take my profit if we do break higher then obviously we've got a series of highs up here so for me it's really about what's the price action doing the highs you are getting higher and the lows are getting higher so the trend in the short term is higher and that's the way i structure everything I, you know i try and not, not let my um biases 
get in the way in that situation which you've given there um yeah in terms of you know how you trade when you uh you say you've got your target would you also leave someone for you know in case you do get a flush higher or, or do you look to you know you have targets where you exit your your entire trade no what I'm, it depends on my feeling at the time um yeah. if i've felt that we were going to go for a move higher then i may liquidate half the position which obviously yeah. would then bring my average down to below the trend line and obviously there is a very very big support level all the way through here at 137.25 through there so what i might do is i might take a little bit of profit up here and then put a stop loss and leave the stop loss exactly where it is yeah and then see yeah. what see what transpires you know it really depends on the situation there is not i don't have a hard and fast rule on any particular trade but one, no, and that's go on sorry no but the one rule i do have is i won't i won't run that profit into a loss so because that line is sloping upwards as soon as the price action breaks that line i'm out well yeah and i think i think you're right in what you said there about you know you have no hard and fast rules in terms of you know how much you look to get at certain levels you know what one thing i've never understood is when people talk about r's as in you know i'm looking for for free r's and then i get out of all my um my my trade and stuff and i think you know for me personally i know a lot of one of the biggest questions i get when you know because i always try and give time to to new traders and stuff obviously if they start taking the uh, the piss a little bit i kind of end up having to say look i'll restrict you to one question a day kind of thing um but normally the number one question is do i use stops and yeah i do not have when i put a trade on i don't have a, a stop price in mind i have a a kind of an area where you know if nothing has changed in the in the news front in the theme front but the market gets to that level um i then start okay well maybe i'm just wrong mm. um but at the same again i could be you know the market could trade sideways from my entry but if all of a sudden i'm starting picking up on news stories or just just the whole theme of the market is changing even though say i might even be a few pit might you know i might be a percent or two on side um but if the theme of the market is changing in my eyes um i'll be out of the trade and you know and same mm. as you know if the if the mark if i'm a percent or two offside but my the you know the theme i'm working on yeah you know, it seems to be being proved more and more right i you know i'm not saying i'll add to the trade but i certainly won't be getting out uh and in terms of that's why i can't really I, i'm not the kind of trade that can have a, a set stop and and i will you know i'll hold my hands up and say this is completely you know what you you know you're taught you always have to have a stop and you know admittedly to an extent you do um but i trade my size accordingly where yeah i could suffer you know a very bad day on a, on a particular market because because i'm looking for those medium longer term moves i'm only trading smaller size anyway mm. um, i think you've also got the benefit of experience there right i think if you're talking to someone who's just starting out i probably yeah. wouldn't encourage them to be stop oh. fluid if you like no no yeah you're you're this is the but this is why it's so difficult to like to explain and this is why i tell people do not you know do not look to copy someone else's style because you know a lot of people like my idea of trading which is kind of sit back just follow news follow kind of you know yeah it might take me three four months to build up a trade idea um and people like that idea because you know they kind of especially people that are doing this part time as well as something else but the fact is yeah i all i do is stare at markets for you know from 5 30 in the morning until the like, uk morning until nine o'clock at night for the us close so you know even subconsciously i'm kind of you know getting market kind of intelligence into my head um so yeah it's, it's easy for me to say oh yeah i don't use stops and i don't have a target i just change my mind or get out or get in when when the theme dictates but i do appreciate that that is something that most people can't do um but uh, what I will say, uh, whilst uh, we're kind of talking about, you know, the whole idea of helping people, if if anyone does have any questions, or not that I reckon, not that I'm a, you know, the best trader out there, far from it. Um, but if anyone does kind of like the ideas of what I'm saying, um, you know, my DMs are always open, as they say on Twitter, um, and I'm always more than happy to talk crap about markets. It's, you know, beats going. Well, you can't go down the pub anymore. So, uh, well, actually, no, now you can. Um, but yeah, so uh, if anyone wants to chat crap about the market, just hit me up. 
Yeah, but I think that you make a very good point. And I think that's one of the things I learned very early on when I first started out on my my sort of markets career. You always try to sort of follow people who you respected and followed, you know, and try and follow their trade ideas. And you suddenly realize that sometimes following them was probably not the best idea. And sometimes it went against your own gut instinct in terms of what you felt the market was going to do. But because you didn't have the experience to know better, you went against your gut instinct and decided to go with them and you ended up losing money. Now, yes. I always go with my gut instinct through an awful lot of trial and error. And ultimately, then no one is responsible for me losing money apart from me. Well, yes, exactly. And that's the, that's the thing, isn't it? Is, is if you followed someone in, it's very, very easy to shoulder none of the blame for your bad trade. Um, and that's entirely the wrong thing to do. Even if you are following someone in, it's your decision to follow someone in. If that goes wrong, it's 100% your fault. Um, and it's so hard for some, especially newer traders, to kind of understand that. Um, yeah, and that's why no, no matter how, you know, when you're first starting, it's good to have someone to kind of roughly kind of not show you the ropes, but just to kind of ask opinions from and you know see see what you can gain from from their perspective. But then do that to three or four different people. Do that to three or four different traders. You know, try and get a, more of a, a rounded feel. Is like you know, I learned I learned probably ninety percent of what I built on in the first year and a half of being a runner. And that was you know there was 30, 40 traders in the trading floor. Any time that I wasn't, I don't know, off to make a cup of tea or something for someone or doing someone's laundry, um, <laughs> I'd be sitting next to a random trader and just watching them. Obviously, yeah, I can see who's making the money and just sit with them for a week. Well, you were actually doing the laundry, were you? <laughs> oh, well, I, well, taking it to the laundry, should I say. Um, yeah, I used to Go have on. to take, take like, you, do, you do not want me doing your laundry, I'll give you a clue. It, everything will come out pink, um, which, yeah, suits me. <laughs> But go on, sorry, I was digressing slightly. I just no, um, yeah, oh. so, yeah, I learned pretty much everything that I then built from from that very first period before I even started trading. Um, you know, it's just in terms of mindsets and you know, not in terms of, I, I wasn't sitting there learning exactly how they trade because everyone is different, but in terms of you know, how do people handle loss, how do people handle winners? Um yeah, and also a thing that I, I kind of speak about nearly every time I, I do a, a podcast or a webinar with someone is the fact that personally, I think the barriers to entry for trading are far too low. Um, and I think it's you know, news today that Robin Hood are going to, uh, they're beginning a, like a, yeah, basically um, drumming up uh, new clients by going to um, city colleges and, you know. Yeah, I think that's uh, wrong. I think that's it's wrong. It's wrong. I mean, I don't know what the SEC is thinking in allowing in, in allowing that. It's 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 the wrong way. It's you know, the reason they're doing that is because they need Robinhood need losing traders to make money basically. Um, because if the reason why I say that, and people might argue it, but um, yeah, most of Robinhood's um, profit comes from selling order flow. Now, hmm. for that, they need lots of order flow. But if you're a trader that is cleaned up trading on Robinhood, the first, one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to then you know, take it professional and then you're not going to be using Robinhood. If you're a professional trader, you are not trading on Robinhood. You're using, you know, you know you're, you're setting up an account with Schwab or, or Ameritrade or someone like that. Yeah. Um, Robinhood. Well, that's a different, right, Ryan, if I could check, that's a different mindset. I mean, generally people who trade with Schwab are investors, not yeah. traders. No, no, I get what you mean. a bad example, but what I mean is people will yeah. go, they'll go for direct market access or stuff like that, or, uh, or you know, like go go to yourselves or stuff. Robinhood is the gamified, you know, it's it's the, it's the sandbox, it's it's the playground for trading, right? If you become successful, you're not going to stay at Robinhood. So what they need to do, and it's very much the same as what happened with Betfair. So Betfair markets for you, that I'm getting most people must know, but for those of you that don't, it's it was the first sports betting exchange. Um, and their model was put sports bettors together, they'll make the price, they'll trade, and Betfair take a tiny commission off of each side, um, which is brilliant. The only downside became 
when you had all these very, very shrewd, successful um, sports betting um, punters were basically cleaning out the, the mug money, the people that you know only have a Sunday bet. They were doing that week in, week out to the extent where Betfair then had to, you know, they were running out of the other side of the trade. So what they then had to do is they basically, they spent an, you know, a huge percentage of their revenue in adverts trying to bring in more accounts to feed their professional punters. And then it got even worse where, you know, now people say, you know, betting is tax free in the UK. Well, if you're, if you earn over a certain amount of money on Betfair, they can charge you up to, I think it's like 50, maybe even 60% of your winnings now because they have to fund ways to get more mug money into the account. Um, and that's exactly what we've seen with Robin Hood. Um, and it should be the other way around. I, well, it, nothing drives me up the wall more than a new trader starts punting. You see them, you know, they, you know, they start posting pictures and stuff. They're trading a market. If you ask them, like, what is that market? It's half of them wouldn't know. You know, if you're trading the S&P 500, you should know, you know, I'm not asking you to name every stock in it, but you should know what are the main, you know, say what are the top five, six weighted stocks in the market? You know, what are the hours it trades? You know, what, what's the tick size? You know, what's the daily ranges like? You know, what's, it's all these questions that, you know, they're not hard to grasp, but until you know them, you, you're always at risk. Um, so yeah, that the whole barriers of entry thing, it's, it does grind my gears. And, yeah, you make well. a very good point. And trading isn't for everyone. Um, I think the mark of a good trader is not so much how many good trades you have, but how you react after a particularly bad one or a bad trade. Um, does yeah. your confidence basically disappear? Um, you know, faster than an ice cube in the desert. Well, and this I think, is it. Yeah, and I think that's a true test. You know, if, if you can bounce back from a bad trade, believe me, I've had a few over the years, then you probably have the right mentality for trading. But, you know, this market has a habit of being very unforgiving to people who take liberties with it. Oh, exactly. It's like we've mentioned before, it's like the market will humble you very, very quickly and readily. It's, you know, it's always looking to, uh, to bite you in the ass, basically. Mm. OK, so as I say, we, we're not really expecting much from the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England. We've got US retail sales tomorrow. And, you know, I think for me, those inflation numbers are likely to point to another disappointing number, perhaps, um, on the part mm -hmm. of the US consumer. And I think that more than anything could well make things complicated for the Fed. But for me, the important number is the payrolls number on October the 8th. Yes, I, uh, that's, that's exactly. Good one. I um like I think like most of the the consensus now is that September for a Fed announcement on uh, tapering what is dead. Um, I think everyone would be shocked if they do anything there. So like you say, um, and kind of like they they telegraphed in the the previous month or so, they're looking for a, a few consistent strong um, payroll data. Obviously, you know I don't think you can call you know, I don't think you can begin to call the payroll data we've had recently consistent. Um, but if we get a, a solid number on a solid October number, well, so for the September data released for the first Friday of October, um, if that is solid, um, I really believe we that brings November into play. My base case for an announcement would be November, um, and it's you know I tweeted back in June or July that yeah I I was expecting kind of a very very heavy-handed kind of yeah, unofficial nod in uh, Jackson Hole. Um, we mm. didn't really get that. Um, but even with that, I also said that they would then wait until November for the official announcement. I'm still, I'm sticking to my guns for a, for a November announcement, but I don't think they'll let it begin until January. I don't think really? it's going to be announced. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be announced and then you know start straight away or start a month after. I think it's going to be a a decent bit of time, but. Um, <laughs> The, the, there's then, a December like, meeting between the November one and January, um, and yeah. I sort of forced, I cast my mind back to 2015, when the Fed were basically procrastinating about their first rate hike, and there was some expectation they'd do it in September 2015. In the end, they didn't. They did it in December 2015, and I'm wondering if a tapering announcement could follow a similar pattern well, as it did six 
years ago. And the uh, the thing is as well, like you say, it's like the the Fed they do love a you know a rely on old patterns if you know what I mean. It's oh. so you know what it's the uh, this is one of the things why I'm convinced that they do. I know it might be a bit small for most people, but I I'm convinced that they only do 10 billion in terms of tapering. Why and they begin in January. Why do I say that? Well, one, yeah, they're they're not in a rush to to taper it all away. So 10 billion fits that bill. But also, if they start tapering 10 billion in January, obviously 12 months, it's 120 billion to do. Do 10 billion a month, you know, it takes out the whole of 2022. And a nice, easy, clean 2022, mm -hmm. the year of tapering. You know, that's. I know, kind of people might laugh that off, but you know. Well, you know, that's that's the perfectly reasonable scenario. What would you say to the people who argue that people like Bullard and Daly, who are voting members next year, want a quicker reduction in the pace of asset purchases? Do you think I that the would, voting members could well, have a I would part to say play? that I would say that it's what what members say when they're non-voters is no guarantee of what they say or what they think when they're voting. Um, it's very easy for you know someone that has no you know, again skin in the game, someone that has no actual say to come out with quite land, outlandish comments. Um, and again, it kind of relates back to what we've said before about targets, um, price targets. You know, someone makes a ballsy comment, they get in the paper. Um, oh, hang on one sec. Hang on one sec. Are you still there, mate? I think we may have lost him for a bit. Sorry, I'm back. Doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to wave someone away. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, one, even if they do stick to their guns and uh, they want the aggressive tapering, it's only, you know, it's only two members. Mm. Uh, but more importantly, honestly, what you've got to be aware of who's voting and what they're what they're saying if a non-voter is suggesting something you have to take it with a slight pinch of salt do not automatically roll that into your thinking okay well they will think the same thing when they are taught or when they are voting um it just doesn't work like that human nature doesn't work like that just thought i played devil's advocate mate no i agree this is just not talk about this is just not talk about the definition of transitory <laughs> I'm not going down that road. I haven't got all day. Um, and you might start to um, roll out your transitory. Um, oh, mate, transitory best right. Best so friend. we're just coming into the end of the webinar now. Did you want to basically showcase um, your? Um, uh, yeah, I can do. One platform. So, so I'm going to hand over control to you. Yeah, so what I will do, hang on, if I can work this out, take control. Oh, um, right, I'm going to try and share my screen here. One sec. So, can you guys see that? Yep, we're good. Yep. So, this, so in terms of when I say, like, everyone knows I follow news. Um, so what I look at constantly is here, these four panels in the bottom left, that's my Reuters news headlines. Um, obviously that is a, a premium product. Um, although, you know, funny enough, if you, not that this is an advertisement, but if you, if you did want access to this, I've, I've got some deal that I can sort people out of. Um, on the right hand side, bottom right, this is the new Squawk headline feed. And the top section, the top half is my own product that is just about to launch called PIQ Suite. Um, and just a quick overview of everything. So basically, I will stare at this window all day, every day. Um, and from this, obviously, part of my, my business is regurgitating the news onto Twitter for people to, to have access to. Um, again, it goes back to what I've said before. Yeah, I'm a huge believer in everyone should have the same amount of information. Um, in terms of um, just a quick kind of promotion for my own product, in terms of my own PIQ suite, like I said before, it, the idea is it's a pimped up version of TweetDeck. 
So if you can see this, you might have to zoom in on the um, on the app. Let me zoom in. I can zoom in a little bit there. Um, so yes, yeah, so basically you can add your own Twitter account, economic data, um, which is just pricing data, and market overview. Sorry, market overview, which is economic, um, which is pricing, economic data, which is your data calendar, Twitter lists. These are the the, the six Twitter lists that I use on TweetDeck, um, and they're they're lists that I've made myself and I curate. I actively curate them, um, and the news feeds at the moment it's just all the main topics you can think of, including sports, obviously, because you know we're not we're not animals. We we need a bit of entertainment, um, and it's all um, curated RSS feeds I've compiled into into one um, column. So you select what column you want. You can then drag your columns around. Basically, the idea is is to make yeah one dashboard if you like. But all the free news that's available um, if in the future, well, very soon, hopefully, we'll um, when, once we've rolled it out, we will be looking to add further features such as this. So basically, this new Squawk window here, which is um, my own, well, this is my login to New Squawk, which yeah, they also, which are fantastic guys. They provide audio Squawk. Um, basically, it's a team of them that's like staring at Bloomberg, Reuters, all this stuff that read out the headlines. Um, and then they put it into a, a text form as well. There soon will be the feature to be able to have this inside the tweet, in, sorry, inside the PIQ suite. Um, we're also looking to add um, the audio squawk. I'm actually also speaking to Reuters as well to see about if we can incorporate their the main kind of news headlines, which are obviously the fastest ones you can get into the um, the PIQ suite as well. And the good news is that the idea and you know the, the couple of guys that I'm kind of that bought into it with me, um, they hate me for it, but my main goal is to make it as cheap as possible, primarily free. So I want, you know, of course there's gonna be certain features that you know you're gonna have to pay up for because if I'm paying for it to have access to it, you're gonna have to pay, pay me for the privilege. Um, you know, I need to make some money somewhere. Um, but yeah, so and this this for me, if you are keen on geopolitics, if you are keen on following the news, um, yeah, this is something you absolutely do need to, or oh, let me uh, stop my sharing now. Um, yeah, so this is absolutely something that will be up your, up your street. Um, and again, although officially it's not launched yet, um, if you're interested, I can, you know, drop me a direct message and I will be able to give you a, a link that will connect you to the the server where it goes live um it just it's not on the official site yet but uh yeah hit me up on that um but yeah it's for me um for someone that loves trading off of news trading off of you know the geopolitics side of things it's you know those four those three things piq suite the new squawk and reuters i can't live without it and that's pretty much it Hello. Yep, yep, I can hear you. Sorry, mate. I just put myself on mute and forgot to take myself off. So I was sort of talking. <laughs> I thought you'd run uh, off. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that, Ryan. Um, as I say, I use I use TweetDeck a lot as well. And to be quite honest, in addition to my Bloomberg, I probably couldn't do without it. And I think that's important. You think you need to follow the right people. Um, and I say I've been on Twitter since 20, 2008, 2009. Some people have come and gone. But ultimately, I think in terms of the people I follow, you know, I generally tend to follow people that are generally um, what I would call uh, responsible when it comes to tweeting information and yeah. um, credible. And I think that's the most important thing, um, because yeah. if you've got credible sources and you've got your own filter as well, um, you certainly need a filter on Twitter yeah. when you see some of the, n the nonsense that comes out. But Actually, nonetheless, yeah. if you follow the right people on Twitter and you ask the right questions, um, yes, you can probably uh, just, go on. Sorry, just quickly, just quickly on the Twitter front, I completely forgot. So these are the Twitter list that I curated. I used to actually offer that as part of my my morning newsletter service, but I've recently decided to make it all free. So if you are on Twitter and you, you know, you're just, you know, you hate how noisy it is because you're following different people's conversations and stuff like that. If you um, go to PIQ lists, which I will tweet uh, maybe i'll tweet it to you so you can see it and from there you can just subscribe to the list that i curate and then 
basically you're following the the refined version of Twitter, and it's it's a complete game changer. I know, you know, like our, our friend Michael Brown, he's been using it since day one. Um, and pretty much most, yeah, it's a mix of traders use it. I know a few quite large brokerages. I've given them access to my Twitter list as well. Um, it's like we said before, it's cutting out the noise. There is too much noise out there. Tweet it to me, Brian, and I'll retweet it. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it all to you. Um, but yeah, it's. I, I think you nailed it. It's like you need to following the right people, the credible people. Um, it's a, it's a complete game changer because there is so much amazing information out there, and there's amazing people that will will you know genuine people that will help you out if you know where you're looking, and and that's obviously half the game is knowing who to look for. Okay, so that's around about just over an hour. I'd like to thank you, Ryan, for uh, taking the time out of your very busy day to talk to me. I'm thank hoping to it. do some more of these. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this um, online once I'm done on YouTube. Um, but um, and I'd be grateful as well if you could sort of feed back on the content that you've heard today, because I will get to see it, and hopefully we'll be able to do these on a more regular basis. I certainly have found it instructive and I certainly hope that um, you guys have too as well. Yeah, I, I thank you for having me. It's been a, been a good little chat. Cheers, Ryan. Thanks a lot, mate.